One, cool. So I'm recording. <laughs> How are you, Adam? Doing well. How are you, Sonny? I am, uh, as I was sharing with you, quite excited about today's uh, today's conversation. As I was mentioning, I've been uh, following Steve on, on Twitter for some time and, and the project. So pumped, man, pumped. So thanks for, uh, thanks for you know, spending some time with me. Hey, I love it. You know, I went from two calls this morning with, with oil and gas guys to a fun podcast conversation. I'll take it. <laughs> right. So, okay. So I guess as a level set, I usually start with, uh, you know, where did we first meet, you know, and it's like, oh, it's with lots of people. It's like seven years ago, eight, three years ago, but it should be probably called out that you and I are, I guess, meeting for the first time, right. Probably in terms of like face-to-face -face or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I, I guess I just pinged you on Twitter, right. That's what it was. And we just kind of connected yeah. that way. Cool. cool. Yeah, Twitter so, seems to be the place these days for, for people to connect. <laughs> I don't know. I, at least for me, I've, I've, I've seen a ton of success using Twitter. Yeah. So. Oh, hundred percent agree, man. No, Cause I, 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 when I remember when I discovered big, uh, not Bitcoin, but Twitter, which was a while ago, like 2011 or something or no, 2020, 2010, I think I was just like, when I saw it, I was like, this is the future of business development. Like, this is how people are going to connect with, you know what I mean? People that are like-minded and it's kind of turning out to be true. So, Okay, uh, let's, I guess, dive into it. You know, as I was saying, um, you know, one of my favorite things to do is to kind of capture people's stories and kind of how they, you know, got to Bitcoin um, and then kind of the arc of maybe their worldview or their career once they learned about Bitcoin and after Bitcoin, right? So curious, where, where does your story begin? And uh, yeah. Well, you know, I'll say the story for me, um, you know, I, I was born and raised here in Colorado. Uh, outside of Denver, and uh, for the most part, lived my whole life here. Um, I've I've spent some time living abroad when I was younger, when I was like 15. Um, I lived in Spain, and then during college, I lived um, in Chile. And you know, so I've traveled a bunch, but ultimately, Colorado's been home. And so, um, I remember when I learned about Bitcoin, or when I heard about Bitcoin for the first time, was had to be around like 2014 in the summertime and i have a i have a really good friend who him and i were both at a wedding down in Tallyride, colorado and we had to drive back to denver like a five hour mm -hmm. drive and during that five hour drive he he gave me like you know he was a hardcore bitcoiner at the time um he gave me like the bitcoin you know speech if you will the shill of, yeah, 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 <laughs> of yeah. what it was and you know i remember thinking it was really cool um and, and I studied economics in college, right? Economics is something I um, took a passion to. And, and, you know, I liked a lot of the aspects of it. Mm. And, but one question I had for him that he wasn't, that he didn't answer really, uh, mainly just because he wasn't yeah. you know, involved in that side was, was how is it produced? How is it mined? Right? Like he would okay. say it was mined and he would talk, yeah. and he, this is right when ASICs were starting to become mm. like, you either had, you, had, you needed an ASIC in order to mine, like GPUs were no longer going to cut it. We were just you know, kind of over crossing over that bridge. Yeah. And so he was taught, he talked about it, like, you know, you need specialized hardware, you need to essentially like there's a really high barrier to entry into mining, but he couldn't really explain to me the mechanics of it. Right. Mm. Um, the, the actual, you know, what's happening behind the scenes, if you will. And so I heard about Bitcoin then I should have listened to his advice and buying some, but I didn't. Right. And, and I went on with my life. I, uh, I wouldn't finish college. And it was after college that um, I was, I was, I just entered the oil and gas industry. So hmm. I just gotten asked to be the like director of sales and marketing for this, this software company. And what they, what their software, <clears throat> what their software product did was it helped oil and gas producers uh, conduct their production reporting, their production management. And so every month they have to report their volumes to the state regulators, to the feds, and to their partners. And, you know, there, you got to imagine there's these oil and gas companies that have wells, you know, in Wyoming, North Dakota, Texas, yeah. and they have to report to each of those states differently, right? Each of these states has their own, like, like form that they want the report in, like the mm. own, their own, you know, the information in a particular order. Some right. states care, care about some information, some don't, right? And so it was like, we, we built a software that tried to help them, you know, bring some ease to that insane nightmare of a reporting process. <laughs> okay. And, and so I was selling, in other words, you know, I was going around to oil and gas conventions. I was, I was dealing with upstream producers, the actual guys, you know, um, producing and operating the well. And 
I was becoming very familiar with with that side of, of oil and gas, of the actual production, upstream production side of oil and gas. And I understood these guys' pain, um, their pain in reporting because our software helped it. But one of the aspects of pain that I was that I was constantly dealing with was their flared gas, right? These guys have waste, wasted hydrocarbons, gas that's stranded um, and that they have to just burn. And, you know, I just always found that fascinating. And, it, you know, it was just one of those, one of those topics that you don't really talk about with your clients because it, it's just like the soft spot, right? Nobody wants to, to talk about their flared gas. Um, and so, right, yeah, I was, I was in the oil and gas industry in early 2018, and I was seeing, I was sitting at a computer all day with, you know, three monitors, and I was seeing the, the news articles come out about how the Bitcoin bubble had popped, um, the mining death spiral was, was occurring. Um, this was early 2018. 2018. So okay, okay. yeah, so price had just crashed from 20 and it had just crossed back down through 10. So it was at like 8,000 bucks, 8,500 bucks, January, February of 2018, um, March, right in that area. And I remember reading one of those articles and being like, you know, like, I wonder how that scam worked. Right. Like, cause it was a scam in my mind still. Like, <laughs> like, because, like, I mean, as far as I, as far as I knew, right. I mean, it was, it was still a scam. Um, yeah. And so I was like, you know what, I want to know how the scam worked. Like, like, why is it a scam? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and my gut tells me just my logic tells me that it's, it's, mu it's very likely that the epicenter of the scam is within the production of, of the thing called Bitcoin, right? Like whoever's producing this is probably, the one pulling the strings and winning. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Right. Makes like sense, I, I just sense. that yeah, was my yeah. assumption, right? Of course, um, of course. So yeah. So I went to go learn about like what the hell is Bitcoin mining? Um and remember this is early 2018. I'm I'm not some Bitcoin OG by any means. Um but I, I went to go learn about that and I remember I remember when I learned about a computational hash um as in terms of you know the simplest execution that a, a computer can execute, the simplest function if you will is changing a zero to a one or changing a one to a zero, right? That single, that binary hash. And I, when, I, when I learned about that and I learned how, how that relates to thermodynamic law, how, how thermodynamics you know, relates to computer science and the limits of computer science. Interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, so like, I mean, the basic of what I, what I what came clear to me was, okay, so the basic, the most basic thing a computer does is changes a zero to a one or a one to a zero. Like that's mm -hmm. its most basic execution. Um, and you can build computers that can do, that can that can execute, you know, trillions of hashes per second. And if you, but if you take the amount of hashes that they've executed and you divide it by the amount of electricity or energy that they've used in order to execute, you can approach zero, right? You can get to this point where a computer seemingly is using almost no energy to execute a hash, but it can never get to zero, right? So it's like you need you need some amount of electricity, of energy, of raw energy to get a computer to do the simplest. Like you can get really efficient, but you cannot get to zero. In other words, you can't have a computer that runs on no energy, right? right. You can't you cannot execute a hash without at least some amount of energy. And that when I realized that, I, I realized wow, this proof of work consensus mechanism that, that Bitcoin uses, it, it, it works, right? It, 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 it's actually appropriate and, it's, and you can truly determine that yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt, nobody can come in and break this, this encryption. And you can you know, conclude beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that you are going to get a a accurate or related measure from in terms of computational work from measuring an amount of energy. So right. in other words, what I determined was from energy, you can determine how much Bitcoin you can mine, right? How, how, or how many guesses per second you can make because there's a limitation to the amount of electricity per guesses, right? And that's what we're, and that's what like we're, you know, on the, on the Bitcoin mining side, that's what they've been doing for the last 10 years is, on the hardware side is trying to push the bounds of that limitation, right? Trying to get as efficient as possible. And like what we see today with, you know, the Antminer S19 Pro being kind of like the top of the line Bitcoin miner, <clears throat> its value add there really is the amount of electricity required to produce an amount of computational work that is significant. And so it's a really efficient chip, but 
even if we make something more efficient than the S19 Pro and, and get more and more efficient, there is a limit to our efficiency that's going to take place. And when I realized that, I realized this thing might not be a scam, right? Hmm. This might actually be a free and open way by which we can, we can compete for a resource that we can, we know is scarce because of these thermodynamic laws, right? We know that, you know, when you, when you audit the blockchain, due to the amount of work that was, that was put into the, to, into the um, ledger, like it's, it's objectively true, right? It's trustless is some of the buzzwords that people use. And that was, that was a really crazy moment for me because I, I realized in order to produce Bitcoin, all you need is energy, right? And then the ability to convert that energy into computational work. So a miner or a computer chip. Um, but really it comes down to, to energy. Like that's, that's the primary input that. Hey, yeah, you know, Adam. Hey, sorry, sorry. I was going to just, I was going to pause it one second. Sorry, I apologize. I have these alerts. I'm just going to kill it. Sorry. I, just give me one No, second. you're good. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's like super annoying when people do that to me. So, um, but yeah. So anyway. Okay. So, so, so fundamentally you had the realization that in order to produce Bitcoin, it comes down to energy. Um, Okay, can, can you speak a little bit about efficiency as well? Meaning, how, so is it incredibly important that you have? Because one of the things that I was, as I was watching Steve's uh, interview or his talk yesterday, the Fidelity talk, he was talking about how like you don't technically technically even need to have like the latest and greatest, you know, ASICs because you're essentially harnessing energy that would have been flared or would have been like just uh, wasted or whatever, right? So like, yeah, yeah. Heck, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think. I mean, I can definitely speak on that. So, I mean, I, I completely agree. If it's, if it's not important it's, or tangential, feel free to just ignore it. Sorry, I was just like curious well, no, about and, that and, thing. Yeah. Well, let, let's put it on the side for a second because I'll, okay, I'll yeah, get yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah, I'll yeah, definitely yeah. speak toward that. Okay, 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 um, okay. But for me in that moment, when I when I realized, hey, like this is this is really an energy market is what, mm. is what Bitcoin mining is. Um, it's, it's a place you can sell energy, right? You just turn it into computational work and then you'll get, you'll get, a payout from that work that you contribute to the network mm. and you know what that moment was was exciting and kind of daunting because i i was in a position where i just learned about this thing called bitcoin really at like for the first time i'd heard about it before but i just really learned about it i think it's legitimate like i, I don't think it's a scam like i initially went into mm. my my you know educational adventure um thinking like how am i going to prove this thing is a scam and it, it so that was one shocking aspect is I was like, I don't think this is a scam anymore. And then the third and the most, I guess the heaviest part of, of the feeling was, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm working in an industry and I'm working with people every day that have millions of dollars, billions of dollars, trillions of dollars of energy that they can't economically bring to market, right? They have so much, I mean, especially just to talk about flared gas. But there's a lot of stranded gas and other things too. But flared gas, especially, I know so many guys right now that are not only are they burning something that is valuable, they're they're getting fined in order to burn it. So it actually costs them money to to burn this energy source. So and and what's even beyond that is these guys have they're complacent, right? They they got to a point where like they don't even want to talk about flared gas because it's like they just they just accepted it as a, a cost of doing business and a pain not worth solving. Like it's just a pain worth enduring in their minds. And I, and that's a tragedy. Mm. Um, and so in that moment, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I need to figure out how to convert gas to electricity because from there I can, can, I can calculate like return, right? I can calculate Bitcoin earnings, dollar earnings, and I can figure out whether or not mining Bitcoin using this gas is economic. Now I knew it was going to be profitable, right? Because like I, I knew that this gas was a wasted source, right? It's like costing them money. So even if you can just reduce their cost, like that's a win. Um, but I was like, I wonder what the economics look like. Like, am I going to spend a million dollars to make ten bucks a day, right? Like, am I, am I going to need a, a hundred thousand days to make my money I got back? You. Yeah, uh, I got right. You. So I, I was like, I just need to figure that out. And so I started making phone calls. I was trying to get anybody to talk to me on, on how to calculate you know, wellhead gas to, you know, using a, an internal combustion engine, like a, a compressor, what kind of electricity output I would get um, and stuff. And when I figured those numbers out, when I figured out 
just how much electricity you can generate with just a little bit of natural gas. Um, that's when I got really like scared and excited, right? Because I was like, okay, so this is real. The, the, the ROI on, on this process in terms of when you get your infrastructure costs back um, makes a pipeline and an LNG facility look terrible, right? Like, I mean, these guys build pipelines hoping to make their money back in 10 years, right? <laughs> like, that's, like, that's the ROI. When you're looking at the process of mining Bitcoin on this gas, the ROI is, is so attractive compared to this. And plus, the upfront cost just isn't nearly as, as burdensome. Um, you know, I mean, talk about building a pipeline, there's a lot of things that go into that. And then you can have a legislator come in and with one inking of the pen, they shut your pipeline down and your whole investment is bust and right. But this process is flexible and this process can scale economically scale to any level. And I, I started just having these, I mean, it was like heart palpitations of thought where, <laughs> where, where I, I was just, you know, I was envisioning the world, world changing in front of me, this, this world this that I had, I, I just learned about. Right. I just, yeah. I, and I, cause I was dealing with these guys every day. I was at these oil and gas shows and I was, I was like, oh my God, like when these guys figure this out, like it's, it's going to be a land rush. It's going to be a land grab. Mm. Um, and I got, I mean, I got panicked that I was, I wasn't going to be able to get in, right? Like I wasn't going to be able to do something with this before these guys figured it out. Um, you know, I thought if I knew it, these guys have to know it. I mean, these are some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. Um, and I'll say that I was, you know, I, my, my timeline was off. <laughs> okay. These guys didn't get excited nearly as fast as I thought they would. Um, I went and told my bosses that like I ran the numbers and I think that I can solve the problem of flare gas. I can, I could solve an operator's flare gas by, okay. by mining Bitcoin. And they, they open mouth laughed in my face. Uh, <laughs> I mean, of I can see their mold. And well, who yeah, wouldn't? Because, <laughs> think about it. I mean, I was, I was, uh, you know, I was a snot nosed awesome. kid. I, I, I was in the oil and gas industry, maybe like seven months at this time. And I came to them and I was going to solve this hundred year old problem of flared gas with this magic internet money machine. Right. I mean, it sounds hilarious from their perspective, right? From their perspective, I would have laughed too, I think. Right. I'd have been like, okay, good luck with that. Right. Um, but, but it, it was true. Um, that's, that's what it came down to is that the economics are real. And so then I, I, I mean, even through their laughter, I was like, I still gotta, I gotta, get exposed to this. I need to get involved. And so I went and started looking everywhere I could for somebody to build me a data center to build me the infrastructure I needed. So then I could go to an oil and gas guy and be like, Hey, can I solve your flare gas problem? Um, and I couldn't find anybody at first. And I remember it was probably three weeks into me looking, I was, I called an old buddy from college who has his own, he's got a business where he, he builds pallets, custom pallets and custom shipping container things. And so I was like, maybe he would do it, but he was, he was really busy and wasn't all that interested. He wasn't nearly as excited as I was. And, you know, you kind of need some excitement to make this thing come to life. And so um, then one day I got a Google alert about something like a, a word that was trending and somewhere along on that page, I remember like it was either like a suggested search term or something was upstream data. And I clicked on that and I saw Steve Barber's website. You know, he had, this was, you know, again, this was still pretty early on. His website was pretty basic, but I remember getting halfway through the first paragraph and being like, I want to work with this guy and invest all my money in him. Like I was ready to quit my job halfway through the homepage of his, of his webpage, because I was finally reading something that I had been thinking and feeling for like a, maybe a month and a half or two at this point, like, you know, feverishly. And so I shot him a cold email to like the sales at upstream, you know, uh, email address and was like, Hey, I think what you're doing is the future. I'd love to hop on a call with you. And he took my call. Right. I mean, I was like, you know, the, there's a lot of people that are excited about this process now. And I get even a lot of people reaching out to me, like just, they just want to talk about it. And I love talking about it. So I usually take them up on it. But, you know, back then I think it was probably a little like Steve probably wasn't getting a lot of excited emails um, at five thousand dollars. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you, you know what I mean? He's probably getting. This is what twenty eighteen like, still or twenty nineteen or where were you guys? This was twenty eighteen. This was like August twenty eight, uh, ju June, July twenty eighteen is when I sent the the email, and then we finally got on a phone call, um, and I remember that phone call well. Uh, we were we were going to have like a thirty minute call. We ended up being on the phone for like two hours, 
or something like that. And, and just because I finally was talking to somebody that, and so then I just kept like asking him questions that I, I, I had been thinking and I had been thinking through and then he would give me an answer and it was like exactly along, along the lines of what I was thinking. And he, he reaffirmed it. And then I realized he was miles ahead of me, right? He had, he had thought about so much more than I had thought about. And he's a petroleum engineer. He's, you know, he's an on-site oil and gas explorer, right? To many degrees. And so his insight into it was just, it was so much deeper than mine. And he had such a better grasp on how this was gonna reshape energy production, especially in oil and gas, that I was like, wow, okay, so here's the other thing, he, he was building infrastructure. So I was like, okay, so I, I don't need to build my build any infrastructure anymore. Like, I don't need to figure out where to build infrastructure. I'm going to have this guy build me the infrastructure because <laughs> he's building exactly for this and he's already built some and he's made mistakes and he's he's iterated his product, you know, the data center and made it better. And and he has a really great insight on the, all the nuance. So I was like, okay, boom, I'm going to have this guy do it. And then, you know, Steve ended up knowing an oil and gas guy that had flared gas. And so through that aspect was able to like help broker and um, get me a place to put my infrastructure, right? To consume gas. And so it all kind of just came together. And what I ended up doing, I mean, when, once I talked to Steve, you know, we just ended the phone call with like, you know, it's awesome, I'll follow up with you. And then like the second I hung the phone up, I was like, I need to go raise money now, like get a business name and we need to go. And so I just, that was the moment I, I went to find capital in order to in order to take the risk, um, which was another another so, uh, adventure well, all of, of itself. Well, you raise capital for what? Sorry, you mean upstream data well, or or no, just no? No, so to, to have yeah to have Steve build me a data center to buy ah, it. Oh, to buy. Gas. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Cool, so I mean, these cool. things aren't cheap, right? I mean, you know, H how much I, does a unit run? It's like a couple well, hundred grand. I mean, or? No, 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 not 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 that not that steep. But you know, if you're talking about the engine. The data center and the miners, um, like the the lowest you're probably going to be talking is for all three of those combined is probably like 45, 50 grand. Like it's like the and that's like small engine, you know, it's like a fifty kilowatt small engine and not a ton of miners, but that's but it's still you know a significant investment. Fifty grand is fifty grand. Of course, um, of course. You know, and I mean, it I, modular? You know, is it is it like modular yeah. where people kind of okay? I see. And and and, and a yeah, slight. And a given site would usually have like at least one of these units or a couple or well yeah it, it all depends, it depends on what kind of gas you got or how and how much gas right if you have a ton of gas you could you could lay a whole ton of engines um but you know if you only have a little bit of gas that's really your constraint is that is that source so yeah. okay so keep going yeah i have so i have like no, tons yeah, of so questions but i want you to keep <laughs> going this is awesome okay yeah so the, i mean i so i was at a point where i was like hey okay so i i, I know where there's a really economic energy source. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. have, I know how to bring it to market now, right? right. I, I know how to efficiently bring it to market. And now I just need to buy the tools and go do it and take the risk that my, my process will, will pay itself back. And then I'll, I'll earn a profit, right? I'll, I'll end up with more money at the end. Right. Um, and that was the risk I wanted to take. And I wanted to take it really badly because I knew that it was only a matter of time until these oil and gas producers themselves woke up and they were going to become comfortable with taking the risk. They were going to be, they weren't going to, they weren't going to laugh so hard at the idea of mining Bitcoin with their gas because the numbers make it not funny anymore. Right. Like, it, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like, like it's, it, it's one thing when you think about like, yeah, it's funny until they, you, you see like a potential revenue and you're like, okay, so this is actually not very funny. This is really serious. And we're missing a massive opportunity. This I mean, I think insane. This right, is insane. I think there is no competition, at. right? I and mean, I've never even heard of another company that even, or maybe there are. Let's not well, even no, talk no, about now it, there, but I'm now just saying. A couple, yeah, no, yeah, there's a couple. Guys I, I heard a couple building, of random but... ones like raise a whole bunch of money or something. But I mean, they're kind of out of the woodwork. They're not like, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. But anyways, okay. So yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> I mean it's, 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 it strikes me and like you guys strike me as like pioneers, I guess, in this space. Because like, like I said, I, I always had a hunch that something was going to happen being from Alberta. And like, uh, I was always kind of, you know, on the lookout, and but, but could never put it together. And so when I first heard about Steve, Steve's company, I was just like bl mind blown. Okay. So keep going, keep yeah. going. So what happens next? What happens next? So, well, so, I mean, I, I needed to find money, right. That was, so right. how do I, this is, 
and this was the problem I had. So like, I mean, I had a, a good bit of savings and you got to remember at this point, I was maybe five months into like believing in Bitcoin. Right. And, and I was, and by the way, I, I had created my Twitter, I think like a week after I talked with Steve. So I found Bitcoin Twitter after I found Bitcoin. Um, and so like, that was an interesting experience, but um, ultimately, you know, I was about five months in. And so I've been putting every dollar of my, of my savings, like every cent I could spare from, from my wage into Bitcoin at this point in time. And so I, I accumulated a good bit of Bitcoin and, but this was the issue is it'd be a, it, it was bad business and it was antithetical to, to what I wanted to do for me to sell my Bitcoin in order to go mine Bitcoin. <laughs> right. Okay. Like it wasn't my, this was ultimately a long Bitcoin play. Right. So ultimately I didn't, I didn't want to sell my Bitcoin to go mine Bitcoin. I feared I'd never mine my Bitcoin back. Right. And like, so instead I was like, well, if I'm already, if we're already assuming the risk of Bitcoin, if you want to call that a, a really high risk, you know, thing to hold, if I'm already assuming that and I'm entering into something that's, you know, pretty new and a lot of things happen on site in oil and gas. So things go wrong. Like I'm already assuming a ton of risk here why not just double down and go all the way? So I leveraged my Bitcoin instead. So I decided to use my Bitcoin holdings as a means by which to gain equity in my own company. Okay. Right? So I was like, you know what, if I'm going to go in, I'm going to go all in and double down. And that, and it was, it was good because I mean, I, I, you know, I found a business partner in my dad, who's a boomer. Right. And uh, my dad's been successful in, in business and, you know, I, I've been coming to, the, but, but he's a boomer. Right. So like, I've been coming to him with this idea and as, as much as he thought it was a pretty good idea, you know, he was not, he was not keen on investing in this necessarily. Um, but I, I kept coming to him with good points and, and I was able to collateralize, you know, I, I mean, I almost had all like pretty much all the money I needed to invest in this, but again, I didn't want to sell it all. So I, I, I wanted to, to leverage it and he allowed me that opportunity. So that way it was like, Hey, if our, if our data center and everything explodes on the first day, like, I'll sell my Bitcoin dad and that way, you know, you won't be all that, like you won't feel much pain from the investment. You won't, you know, you won't have much of a loss. Um, and we can, we can be 50, 50 partners. And so that's what I ended up doing is I ended up convincing my dad finally. And what's funny is I convinced him like right in the heart of the bear market. Like that's when he became convinced when Bitcoin was like five, 4,000 bucks. Wait, right? wait, what did you bucks. convince him on though? Like, so had you like picked out a, pro, uh, like a, like a location or a partner to actually like deploy this unit in, in the field? Steve, or were well, you like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, Steve, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was working with upstream data. I was like, dad, I, this guy up in Canada, he's yeah, yeah. the perfect guy. I'm going to have him build it. Like it's going to yeah. cost us so this. You, you raise the money and, and then where does it go into some site where it goes in it? goes into infrastructure right so it's mm. you know, our boxes yeah so our, our operation is is currently up in canada um ah. we're helping an operator mitigate his flare volumes we're consuming his gotcha. gas yeah we give him a, yeah we give him a tiny you know a little bit of money every month because i mean he can't sell this gas anyway right so either he's gonna have to go out and buy thousands and thousands of dollars worth of computers and engines and data centers or i could it's got really it. where we, okay. you know, that, that's how it. I got in. Yeah. Interesting. The operator, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. The operator wasn't comfortable with that risk, but I was comfortable with it. Okay. Okay. So, right? so I was like, yeah, cool. I'll get the box. I'll find the gas. And then we get the Bitcoin and hopefully we'll make our money back on what it costs us to build all this crap. And so that's, that was really, it's a really, really basic business plan. But you know, my dad, like I said, I mean, seventies boomer, I mean, this, you know, he's retirement. He's hanging out with grandbabies. Like he's not looking to go take a bunch of Bitcoin oil and gas risk. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of had to work that deal with him, but you know, obviously now he's ecstatic that, that we did it and he thinks it's brilliant. Um, and he's a total Bitcoin bull, which is awesome, but Oh, totally, man. He's a seven year old Bitcoin bull. I love it. I, you know, the text messages just, just warm my heart when I see it. I, dude, I've got my dad on standby to watch this interview, by the way. I told him last, I was up till <laughs> good, four in the good. morning, like interview, like watching everything I could, reading everything I could about this. I was so pumped. Um, Okay, so, I mean, in my eyes, I think I said, mentioned this already, but like, uh, this is probably the most asymmetrical, like kind of business that I've come across in Bitcoin, probably since I've learned about Bitcoin in the sense that, I have like if my, my excitement level is like nine, eight out of 10. And the number of people that I know that know about this or even care or should care. I mean, it's just, it's like, it's like beep, 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 like barely alive, like one out of 10. Well, so I want to kind of like, yeah, 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 go ahead. So, so here's one point I wanted to mention on that is 
if you if you were a, a staunch Bitcoiner during this last bear market during 2018, 2019, and you were listening to religiously listening to like some podcasts, like a pop podcast or something, I'll tell you on a pop podcast, um, Saifedean came on and said that, you know, Pomp, one of the questions Pomp would ask at the end was, what's your favorite, or what's, what's the most exciting company in crypto or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Saifedean was like, well, I'm kind of biased to this because I'm an investor, but upstream data, right? And that was in the heart of the, and I remember hearing that and I was nice. in the middle of dealing with Steve and I was like jumping up and down, like, oh my God, I got to get involved. I got to, so, you know, this has just been always, I agree with you. I think this is one of the, maybe for some reason it's like the least sexy part of bitcoin is 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 mining i guess oil and gas isn't very sexy to people anymore it's pretty bit pretty much been villainized and so like i don't know why uh this hasn't been something that is like talked about on mainstream for the most part but i, I mean i, I, mean, I, agree the, I saw I the this fidelity thing there's like a coin desk article but i mean by and large like you know it kind of goes unnoticed i feel um and steve does a great job you guys do a great job on twitter um but yeah i saw max max kaiser recently kind of retweeted some of the stuff that that you guys are doing i, I tweeted something and I, I just hope more people pay attention but but can we step back a little bit just for a few seconds yeah. and can you kind of like if somebody was just like listening to this and they had a few seconds like can you can you explain why this matters like for example like bitcoin is like oh an energy even bill gates i think this morning i was listening to him talk and he's like ah oh, it takes a lot of energy okay and it just bugs the hell out of me uh so can you speak to that like how this kind of fits into that picture and then second of all, like, oh, there's just so much. But um, one thing that really caught my attention was like, uh, Steve was talking about like how massive, how massive of an opportunity this just like is. So if you can kind of like paint that picture, I don't, I mean, whether we use numbers yeah. or not, but like it was, it was like ginormous in terms of the opportunity oh, size. Yeah. So I mean, mm. ginormous is appropriate. Um, let me say this. So we don't have, an energy supply problem on earth. We never have. Um, we have an energy utilization and distribution problem, okay? We have so much energy that we're, we're gonna be just fine in terms of a civilization as a, as a species. Um, we're really bad at utilizing it and delivering it efficiently. There's a ton of waste in between. And there's a, a lot of reasons as to why there's waste um, in terms of you know, just kind of the, how, how our, how our grid infrastructure is, is structured and really just how energy production works. Um, there's, you always pretty much overproduce. And so, and especially when it comes to generating power, when I'm talking about electricity, um, Bitcoin mining, and I'll give you a really, the simplest example to highlight this Bitcoin mining is essentially a secondary energy consumption market, right? Where, when it's not economic to bring energy to a human being, like to bring it to the, to the outlet in your wall, typically they waste it because it's, it's not economic to deliver it. What Bitcoin mining does is it provides a secondary market to sell electricity or energy to, and geography no longer matters. And geography, geographical constraints are really what are one of the biggest problems with distributing electricity is there's loss right if you have a, a power line that ran across the country like you'd have to send a, like an insane amount of energy to even get one little watt to pop out on the other end right there's loss in between and so what bitcoin does is it allows you to deliver it to the internet you can sell that electricity essentially to the internet right to bitcoin to the bitcoin network and that changes everything about how energy is produced because now we have to those who are producing it have to consider this secondary energy consumption market um when they make their decisions right now it it you know it might make sense hey if we're going to build this but well, we should also build a bitcoin mine next to it if we're going to build a solar farm like for this this city like we should have a bitcoin mine next to it because anytime that we're producing a ton of electricity from the sun but people aren't turning on their air conditioners or their heaters and they're not demanding it. We should sell that energy to Bitcoin. Wait, wait hold, on, then, hold on. Why not batteries? Right? So, isn't, isn't batteries the obvious well, answer? Like, so how do you do that? Yes. Okay. So but, talk about that just a second. So the cost, right? I mean, I, I just had a call this morning with guys that are working with solar 
Um, and they're talking about how they have a couple of options in order to produce more electricity. They can either upgrade their substation for like 20 million bucks. Um, they can upgrade their uh, another piece of their infrastructure for, you know, like two and a half million dollars, or they could end up diverting, you know, this amount of electricity to mining Bitcoin, right? That way, that way they can actually go and produce more, put more solar panels around and have more electricity coming in because they have another place to consume it. And they could do that and it's probably gonna be like 400 grand, right? So like, it's, it's no, batteries are just really expensive. Like it's just the economics of, hey, so we're gonna spend 5 million on this battery. How long until we make our money back? Like how long until it, it we, you know, we fill it up, right? When people aren't demanding it. And then when the grid demands it, we drain the battery. How many times do we need to do that before we make our money back? That's part of the issue, right? Is that it's not very attractive. And so what happens is you get subsidies because you're doing something green for your Tesla industrial battery. It's, it, that's how they make it economic is they gotcha. give you, right? They either reduce the cost of production and they reduce the cost of consumption um, of the batteries because they, they give you these kickbacks and things. Same thing with oftentimes, just even with solar or, or wind um, you know, production or power generation, like without subsidizing it, nobody wants to invest in this stuff because you can't efficiently, you, you end up generating so much more electricity than you sell. And that's the biggest, that's the biggest flaw with especially, you know, renewable energy is it's intermittent energy, right? It's so solar and wind. They don't produce consistently all hours of the day and who they're selling to the people don't consume consistently at all hours of the day, right? If the temperature is different outside, it can change. And so there's so much loss in between that the ROI is very attractive. Whereas with Bitcoin mining, they can guarantee that every watt that they produce, they sell it. They bring every watt to market um, economically. And so what that does is it makes every kind of energy production and power generation more attractive, no matter what it is. Even if So now look at oil and gas. Oftentimes what the problem is, is you drill a vertical well, you go explore horizontally and you find a ton of crude oil, great, but you might also find a ton of natural gas. Well, you can't sell that gas. So they literally have to burn the gas in order to sell the oil, right? Because when they, when they, when they pump into the well and they, they pull crude out, gas comes with it. And if they don't have a pipeline, they can't sell ah, the gas. Right. So, so now it looks, but you, with Bitcoin mining, they can sell the gas now. So now this it's a really dumb question. To go, to there, go there's there, there's the no well. way to right. make crude. Like there's no way to turn crude, obviously, into electricity on site, right? No, there is. Yeah. No, crude's a, a great fuel. I mean, source. Well, how just, would, what, wouldn't, isn't that another, like, I mean, couldn't they just, that's all they no, do no, is just mine Bitcoin? Like, why wouldn't they? Well, they could. But that? here's the thing with crude is yeah. that crude is, it's economic to deliver crude because mm -hmm. you can put it in a truck, right? You can put a, t a lot of it in a truck when it's $60 a barrel and you can put, you know, 200 barrels in a truck or, or hundred barrels you. in a truck, I right? It's you. like, okay, well, we're talking about what, you know, six, $6,000. Um, if, if we can deliver, if we can get that truck to drive from this point to this point for only a couple hundred bucks, like it's still very, it's more economic to just drive the oil to go get refined than it is to mine Bitcoin with it. And, right, and companies, like I got you. I got that makes right? sense. I, and companies like Syncrude and Suncor, like, it, 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 does this touch kind of like Fort McMurray and all of the the stuff going on in there, or is this more for like these remote locations, like you're saying, um, kind of where it's hard to get pipes out to and whatnot? Different hanging fruit, right? But that's a great point because it, there's a couple of there's a couple of ways in which Bitcoin mining specifically impacts oil and gas. That's that's really that are really important. I think worth highlighting. Okay, the first yeah. one is. To your point, the lowest hanging fruit are the, the wells that are out in the middle of nowhere. They have really clean gas and they can't, they don't have a pipeline. They're never going to have a pipeline because they're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's just never going to be economic to sell or to, yeah, to, to deliver to market. So mining Bitcoin is like perfect for them. And even more so, sometimes these guys are feeling regulatory pain from the gas they're flaring. So it's even costing them money. So like those guys, this is such a practical no brainer solution to, to their to the issues they're feeling around this and they can turn it into a revenue stream. Um, if you move up the, the, the ladder a little bit, but this is still a secondary energy consumption market. Even the guys that are selling to the pipeline, see upstream oil and gas producers have pretty much, have pretty much uh, been, been subject to the midstreamers, the, the guys that build the pipelines 
they, they call the shots in many ways, right? Because you think about these guys come to the table to, to come to an agreement on, Hey, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sell my gas to your pipeline. Right. And you're going to pipe it to the world. Um, like what kind of a deal am I going to get? Well, the pipeline guys have always been like, well, if you don't make a deal with us, like, what are you going to do with your gas? You know? So it's either you make a deal with us, you make our deal or fine. Like then you don't sell your gas and they'll just, you know, like to hell with you. Um, but now these oil and gas producers can come to that, to the table and come to that discussion and go, Hey, what kind of a deal are you going to give me for my gas when I, when I give it to your pipeline? Because if you don't give me a good deal, I'm just going to mine Bitcoin with my gas and screw you. Right. Yeah. And so now, <laughs> so now that the whole dynamic changes of who kind of holds, who holds the power of, of the actual source energy and the oper the producers have always felt like they're getting screwed by the, the pipeline guys. And now they have a tool to be like, hey, if you're not going to give me the price I want for my gas, I'm just going to mine Bitcoin with it. Like, I don't even want to deal with you and your pipeline BS. So, I mean, it's just really shifting the dynamics. And then here's the other side of it is that what we're seeing now with Bitcoin's, you know, crazy price appreciation, you got guys that are getting that, that they're selling their <laughs> gas to the they're selling their gas to the pipeline for, for two dollars in MCF, right? oh, two dollars per thousand cubic feet. OK they run the numbers on mining Bitcoin. It's like $9 per ounce. It's like five times, they oh, get five Lord. times oh, more Lord. dollars for their gas if they mine Bitcoin with it. And these guys are sitting there like, whoa. So, I mean, this is going to impact a lot of things. Right? This is really going to impact how these guys move because the economics are really strong right now. The numbers are really strong. And I mean, if and I assume a lot of these guys are, or whatever, they're kind of selling the Bitcoin and taking the cash or something to maybe pay their expenses, or maybe they're not. Are they? Because if they're holding on to the Bitcoin, then what does that mean for them? Well, I think each one of them are going to go through <laughs> right, the same right. thing that we go through, right? Is probably initially they'll probably liquidate most of it, like you know, and they can liquidate it on a day to day basis, right? I mean, the second that they mine the Bitcoin, they can put it into dollars. But then what they're going to find is they wake up like on a day like you know today or last week and they're going to think to themselves damn we should have held on to some of that bitcoin um so maybe this maybe this year we only sell you know 65 percent of what we mine um and you know cover these costs but we're going to actually end up allocating some of our holdings into bitcoin and so like yes there's going to be a lot of impact so so can you talk about like uh, are you allowed to share like how not how many units but like how, like how how much of this idea has like actually made its way into the world? Like in terms of Watts or I don't know, in terms of just like some metric that, that people can kind of be like, or I'd like say, 1% um, of the potential or I don't know, like. Oh, in terms of potential, we're, I mean, a sliver. Like not even. So this is, yeah, that's a good, I'll, I'll touch on that too. So let me just give you the scope of the market. Um, in, in North America alone, the amount of wasted gas could power the Bitcoin, the current Bitcoin network, probably five or six times over. Wait, hold on, sir. What'd you say? The what? Say, so say that again. All, all of the electricity that the Bitcoin network uses. Yes. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it could. There's like five times that amount of potential electricity just from the wasted gas in North America. Got it. Okay. Just okay. North America. Worldwide, we could power the Bitcoin network with. With I'm talking about just gas, just wasted gas. We could power the Bitcoin network like 15 times over. Right. And those are the reported numbers. And so like, I'd like to be really clear when I say like reported numbers aren't always the truth. <laughs> um, and in this case, I guarantee you they're very conservatively low um, <laughs> because it's not like Nigeria <laughs> is accurately reporting the amount of gas yeah, that they're yeah, yeah. like letting it. Right. I mean, there's nobody to oversee that. I mean, Venezuela, nobody. I mean, come on. Um, like you need satellite photos to try to get to the truth. Right. So there is so much gas. Now, just even North America, we are incredibly endowed with natural resources, hydrocarbons especially. Um, and the amount of natural gas here is insane. So let me, let me put it this way. In order for the majority of, like a, a, a significant majority of the natural gas in North America that's, that's wasted, that's flared, in order for the majority of it to be committed to mining Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin needs to be like, four million dollars a coin because if you think about it in order for that much competition to be taking place like the more people that come on and mine bitcoin the less bitcoin each person mines you know what i mean hmm. right it's a direct like like no matter how many people come to mine bitcoin the same amount of bitcoin get produced yeah yeah yeah, yeah right yeah. 
So mm-hmm. as more oil and gas guys turn on, it becomes less economic for the next guy to come mine Bitcoin, right? Because the numbers aren't as attractive for him because the earnings are like, no, then the ROI is too long. It's, it, it looks like a pipeline. Okay. Um, so, but then the price of Bitcoin goes, you know, skyrockets. And all of a sudden, those guys that looked, you know, four months ago at, the, at mining Bitcoin are going, oh, crap, it looks economic now. And right. And that's kind of the process by which this is happening. And in order for us to really use a significant percentage of the gas, we, we're going to need a million dollar plus Bitcoin price. Um, otherwise, it's not even that's how much gas there is. There's just it's ungodly amounts of energy that get wasted every day. In, in the U.S. alone, it's it's over a billion cubic feet a day. And this right? is so, just oh, this is just gas. Like you said, that it gas. could potentially make solar viable, right? I mean, oh, no, right? yeah, it makes solar. I mean, it, it makes and this is what's oh, crazy is it makes it like, <laughs> like think about the, so, some of the problems in the world really just come down to it's it doesn't you can't make a dollar solving this problem. And if you can't make a dollar solving the problem, then you really have a problem and you need an innovation. Right. Because unless you can solve a problem in a sustainable econ- economically sustainable way. Problems often don't get solved. Right? They they have to. It, it takes things like you know. I mean, you think even about illnesses. Like if if guys that were making you know drug companies, if people that are trying to cure illnesses, if they can't make a dollar doing it, like if they're not going to get wealthy from curing cancer, nobody's going to cure cancer. Um, like it's just kind of we're only as good as our incentives in many ways. And um, what Bitcoin does is it incentivizes us to provide every human being on Earth with electricity. Because it now people are incentivized to go produce electricity, to go generate, produce energy and generate electricity because they can do it more profitably than they could before Bitcoin. Because now yeah. I, could, I could go to geothermal in the middle of Antarctica. It makes sense for me to even tap into geothermal in Antarctica and produce electricity because I can sell it from Antarctica. And then if people want to come move to where I'm producing electricity, I can provide them electricity too. Right? I can actually make it habitable because I can do it for a profit. So there are these these stranded oh civilizations, God. right? There are these stranded communities, stranded cultures that are developing, right? They, they you, maybe don't even have electricity. This is a reason to go provide them with electricity. Have you learned much about or read much about like the people that used to live in Canada and the United States before we got here? Not much, man. I, my Canadian history is is yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a bit of a con- considering I'm working for a Canadian company. Um, I don't know what the politically like or in, politically incorrect or politically correct term is, but like the Aboriginal people or whatnot. But but I but right. recently I kind of came to the conclusion that they the, 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 they represent something like five percent of like the Canadian population. And and I, again, I don't want to go into it because I don't know too much about it. But there are some shifts happening, um, like kind of at a global level, and just like I think governments and people are recognizing that we've, you know, maybe haven't done things the right way and. There's like this, um, and one of the kind of yeah, no shit. One of the, yeah, I was, I'm trying to be like, uh, yeah, just, you know, I'm trying to like you know tread carefully here, but you know, but I do I do think that it's um it's interesting because I kind of sense that Bitcoin uh, perhaps you know uh, could help a lot of these like cultures because if you look at how spread out they are and how you know what I mean decentralized they are, um, but how resource rich perhaps uh, you know some of their places that they live in are that maybe maybe bitcoin could could serve in some way but this is insane this is just like the oh my god oh yeah, i, I mean, can't even no, like i can't i can't I'm even you. fathom it this is insane okay i want to touch on one okay sorry i want to touch on one thing so we one thing i kind of like didn't really get but like i kind of get now is, is are you saying that that there, like so there's a there's a world of bitcoin <laughs> of bitcoiners like with a lot of bitcoin that's worth a lot of money out there right a lot of them probably will be hearing this thing you're saying that they don't even need to live necessarily or be someone who runs one of these like oil i mean not oil rigs but yeah these like places where they're taking on oil and natural like they could potentially plug into a net i mean maybe i'm gonna jump in the gun here but is it well, possible for them to plug into some sort of network where they can bring their money and and, and essentially what I'm trying to get at is like somehow acquire one of these units and install it in a place that someone doesn't maybe want to pay the $50,000 or $100,000. Do you, you kind of well, no, going with this? Is there a world yeah, where that so, can happen? Well, I think there, I think there's opportunity for that. I mean, that's, that's really what I ended up doing. Right. Is right. I, I was one of those people. So, so how does it, yeah, yeah. It, it could be done. Um, Cause I did it. I, I, 
you know, I but could I that be done in scale? Is what I'm saying is like, well, like people like I have Bitcoin here, here's here's my you know X number of Bitcoin, and then you just lock it, and you take a loan against it, and then the equipment's just bought and placed in, and they get a return, and it's all like, you know, right, super right. easy. I, I agree. easy. No, def- <laughs> definitely right. But this is this is the point is that you know my the the economist part of my brain tells me that, and this is what it was telling me, you know, even when I was trying to get started was. Well, these oil and gas producers themselves, the guys that actually own the well or own the solar farm or own the whatever, they're going to come around and they're going to look at this and they're going to say, oh, that's like, I'm comfortable taking that risk myself. I don't need somebody else to come in and put the money up. I'm comfortable taking on a loan. I mean, these oil and gas guys, they have relationships with banks. And I mean, they've they, they borrowed money and taken on capital plenty of times. They're very, they're, they're, you know, very knowledgeable in that regard, and they could, they have access to good financing, and so they'll they'll just get comfortable doing this themselves. So uh, while I, I agree with you, yes, there's definitely room for somebody to come come in and say, you know, go to an oil and gas producer and say, hey, like, can I help you solve your problem? Like, I'll, I'll how about this? Like, let me go buy all the infrastructure. I'll come in and use your flare gas, and I'll give you ten percent of everything I earn. Right. Like, and you have no risk and you just end up, you you just start getting 10%. Like there's room for that. I mean, I think guys can go do that. I mean, it's a lot, I mean, you're gonna have to go find money. You're gonna have to go find capital. You have to take risk. You're gonna have to figure out, you know, how to, how to do this, how to actually deliver. But Hey, this is 21st century wildcatting. I don't know if are you familiar with the term a wildcatter? Tell me what it means. That kind of a wildcatter, the wildcatters were like the guys back in the, in the days of exploring for oil and gas that just literally, you know, shot out west, went to go buy some land, drill vertical wells, and hopefully they struck black gold, right? Um, well, this is 21st century wildcatting, where now, like, it actually makes sense to go find distressed assets, to go find orphaned oil and gas wells, go find geothermal in the middle of, you know, S- Siberia, because you can bring it to market right there on top. Okay, okay, stop there one right, second. So, so that's another thing I keep getting brain, my brain goes, it kind of stops working is you keep saying, bring it to market, right? So here I have this, let's say solar panel farm. I, I get how, okay, a sun isn't up at the middle of the night. So I need to store it in a battery so that if these houses need it, I can give it to them. But when you say, uh, okay, wait, well, I'm not going to store it because it doesn't make economical sense. I'm going to mine Bitcoin with it and make money. My thing is, is like, wait, but at nighttime, that neighborhood still needs the solar energy. So they're not getting it. Meaning how is it acting oh, yeah, as a yeah. battery? Sorry, I'm just a really dumb well, question. No, no, so but... <laughs> that, uh, no, that's a good yeah. thing worth clarifying. Like, by the way, big, people say Bitcoin is a battery. I, I kind of cringe a little bit. Okay, that. I, okay. Even, no, even though I do understand where they're coming from, what they're coming from is in many ways, it solves the same purpose as a battery. The reason that you have that battery, mm. I mean, let me put it this way. As, as the person producing, say you owned the solar farm, right? And then you bought the battery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The real reason you bought the battery was so that you could store energy that you produced beyond what was getting consumed, right? The only reason the battery would start to fill right. up. Is, yes, yes, right? You're yes, producing yes, more yes. than is needed. Yes. <clears throat> and then, right? And then when people end up con- con- demanding it, you can sell it to them, right? Yes. You can drain that battery and, and make money. Yes, so, yes. So really what you're doing is you're just, you're, it's a, a battery is just a, a, a mechanism by which to, to hang on to electricity until you can bring it to market, until the market demands it. Got it. Right. Now, you're right. There is the, the reason that Bitcoin also solves the same problem, essentially, is it just allows you to bring it to market right away because you convert it into computational work and you get Bitcoin rewards on that. So it's, it's effectively just another way to sell it. Right. Instead of storing it, you could just mine Bitcoin with it. And then, right, you're getting your money back for every single watt that you produce, even if humans aren't demanding it. And that's the thing is that the only reason that these machines would kick on is because, you know, the, the, the human beings that are demanding the electricity from your solar farm aren't demanding as much as you're producing. So when you're producing more than they need, you, you can't do anything with it. If you don't have a battery, you might as well sell it to Bitcoin. And then, right, if they start demanding more, then you turn off your Bitcoin mining machines and you give them everything they need and then... Right. So it's just a okay. way to be more efficient in delivering energy to market with oil and gas. I see what you're saying. It's, yeah. it's really an issue about geography oftentimes. Right. It's just like, well, this gas is like, like it just, you have to build like miles and miles and miles of pipeline yeah. for a little bit of gas. We're never going to make our money back. We're not building the pipeline. But with this amount of gas, like we could mine a good bit of Bitcoin. 
Right, we can generate a lot of power and we're already, so, you know, we're so, already going to be burning the gas. So. Oh, so, okay. Can you, sorry, can you explain to me, like, I guess, what's your relationship with upstream then? So you said you went, you bought a unit, you financed it. That, that was like fascinating, but are you there? You're the, are you doing BD for them specifically yeah. or? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I only came on just what a month ago. Um, so how's that journey and, been? And what, what, what are kind oh, of, like your, what are kind of, so I was interested in knowing what your goals are and how can people, I don't know, kind of help you guys get there. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my goal, my goal is to make so many oil and gas operators, Bitcoin miners that, that we can't build fast enough. Um, and that's, that's my goal, right? It's to just, it's to give every oil and gas producer a tool that they can leverage to, to be better producers, right? To be better businesses, better, um, operators and, and what's your biggest friction point like where where are you getting and where like I mean, is it you, still, is, are people, people must be waking up now, right? At like, uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, the, the timing is the timing is great. Um, yeah. we're, we're kind of at that all at once moment where even, you know, the guys that upstream was talking to last year that maybe weren't all that sold on the idea. They're like calling back like, Hey, we should have probably done that. Look at the Bitcoin price. Um, it's kind of like what they're, you know, we're kind of at that moment where any oil and gas producer that's flaring gas today um, and isn't taking a serious look at running the numbers of what it would be like to, generate you know to mine bitcoin with with that gas if they're not at least taking a serious look and considering it i think they're fools um i think that pretty soon they're going to be dinosaurs because i mean you don't need to be a you don't need to be a bitcoin bull or sold on the bitcoin story if you will in order to to leverage the network and be a better oil and gas producer right like i said you I mean you can liquidate every day so um and they're dipping their toes in right so what, what i'm seeing now is you know, I said I said this on a clubhouse room, and I think people thought I was just like, I don't know, being cocky or or something. But like, I haven't had anybody. I, I'm talking to guys all day, every day. I haven't had anybody tell me no yet, right? I'm either moving forward with them in terms of like they they want to buy some data centers and start mining Bitcoin, or they're like, oh. <laughs> or they're going back to their engineering teams and they're they're going to get back to me. They're going to look at this and they're going to get back to me. And they're but like nobody's just been like, no, we're not interested. Like nice. Talking. So are, are like, you, are not you one time yet? Adam, so. are you are you saying that that people are kind of over that like most of their like uh, initial hesitations and now it's a bit of a, a rush towards like making this happen or are we still like in terms of awareness like of like the entire market that you spoke of like what are, are we still like at the early stages in terms of people even knowing yes. about Bitcoin or do you think a lot of people now are kind of woke to this idea and are and are just a matter I think of time? The 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 amount of people that are aware of this idea definitely is much greater than like 2018, even 2019, right? Um, it's kind of like what I spoke about earlier is like, they've kind of been chuckling about this idea. And it's like, we're right in that moment where their laughter is stopping and they're running the numbers and it's no longer funny. Like, <laughs> it's not like serious, right? First, what is it? First they ignore you, then they uh, laugh, laugh yeah, at then you, they laugh then at they you. fight you, and then you win or something? And then you win, yeah. And then um, they join you, really, is what happens. Right? Yeah, right? Um, <laughs> and they join you. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so on that... Okay, yeah, I was gonna ask you. So, um, are there any like, uh, like poster childs or like, uh, I don't know, case studies, like, or like people that have gone through this process that you guys are highlighting? I don't know. I'd be really curious to know, think, like, you know, somebody who's. I mean, it sounds like you're 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 pretty close to that, right? You. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't, and I don't. I'm not gonna disclose any of the guys we're working with, just you know, because they, you know, the oil and gas producers that they, they're not looking they're to be private. famous. Um, mm. yeah, they're, they're pretty. They're just you know, mm. they're they're modest and humble guys. Um. But I'll say this, there are, there are more data centers out there in the oil, oil and gas field than you would ever guess. Like we're, we're, we've worked with more people than I would have guessed um, when, I, when I joined the team. I, and I realized like just how many of these we've, we've built and, and delivered for customers. <laughs> I was like, whoa, like things are happening faster than I thought they would. Um, but this is the thing is there's a there's a the real constraint on on this evolving to the next level like becoming a serious thing the biggest constraint is asic production is semiconductor chip production because like i said before when we when we look at the amount of gas i mean there's some oil and gas companies that if they really want to like get rid of their flare gas we're talking about millions and millions of dollars of infrastructure like of engines power generation and really what the issue is is miners like there's not enough miners right now there's not like the actual 
ASIC machines on Earth, not enough chips on Earth to consume the electricity that this gas could generate. Like there, it's the scaling problem is, it's not necessarily, I mean, there, there is a problem in terms of Bitcoin scaling because, you know, ASIC production is bottlenecked at foundries um, and foundries are pretty much a monopoly and, or, you know, certainly an oligopoly. And it's just a slow nightmarish of a, of a process to produce semiconductors to, to get into that space. But, you know, even if we had that, there would be, there would be an issue still just because of the sheer scale of the problem of gas that we're talking about. I mean, it's seemingly an endless ocean of natural gas that's, that's utilizable. And so, you know, I think, I think there's going to be a lot of pushes to, to mitigate flare gas. I think this, you know, the current U S administration, the Biden administration um, has made it quite clear that they're not very pro oil and gas and that, and I think that producers who are flaring gas, that's going to be a way in which for them to, to get leveraged by regulators is they'll come after you for your flare. Um, Bitcoin mining solves like that's that. That's crazy. Issue, right? And that is so, like, wild. That's huge. Um, plus the, and, okay, so here, here's the kicker, This is the, the kicker, most right? insane thing. Dude, I'm interviewing Blockstream later today. And I was up till four oh, in the yeah. morning last night, like, excited about this call. Okay, so go go <laughs> ahead. Yeah. No, so so let, let me let me tell you this. So this is the part that's really kind of cool too. And this is this is where I get people's eyes opening up a little bit. Um, people that are maybe hesitant or um, distrusting at first is the ROI, the environmental ROI, right? Meaning the amount of carbon emissions you reduce per dollar invested absolutely destroys all other mainstream environmental green initiatives. Okay, like for like 50,000 bucks, you can reduce 10,000 tons of carbon emissions per year mining Bitcoin in this way. Okay, it's like 50 grand. I mean, like most, most mainstream initiatives are like one, one 80th to one 8,000th as efficient as mining Bitcoin on flared guesses in terms of the environmental ROI per dollar spent. So if we, if you really want to make an impact on making the air cleaner and making the world a better place, um, your dollar is best spent mining Bitcoin on flared gas. Like that's just a fact. And so I think what we're going to see is a massive amount of, of money that comes from kind of subsidized sources. Like, I mean, there's, there's initiatives where like, if you invest in a green process, like 50% of your upfront cost gets covered by the government. Like, I think people are going to be taking advantage of that and going in like carbon credits, right? Um, the oil and gas industry will be leveraging the hell out of this technology in order to, you know, reduce their, their carbon emissions per dollar. Um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, it's, it's, it's harmonious, right? It's a 360 degree win where it makes Bitcoin better, it makes the operator better, and it makes the environment better. Um, like no and, one's mad, what, what no one's have, losing. And all it is, is you've got a Bitcoin miner, right? The ASIC or whatever. You've got uh, a generator that's turning the natural gas into electricity. Is that right? And what's the yeah, third then, thing you said? It's just the metal center. casing? Oh, the data center. Yeah, oh, you, just you like need, computers. You yeah, like a you know essentially a structure to house these computers. Oh, out oh in the middle of, got it, got it, nowhere, got it, got right? it, got it. Yeah, yeah, like the yeah. metal. I've seen it. Okay, that's it. Those are pretty much the three inputs. That's it. Um, and then you know whatever it costs you to produce that gas, which most of these operators they're already spending the money to produce this gas because it's it's a byproduct of them producing crude. I mean, this is just such a no brainer for the flare guys. And so you know we're I'm just sitting with them and I'm just I'm just running through these things and I'm just telling them, hey. You know, this is why you should look at it this way. And this is, I mean, and this is one of the biggest pieces of advice that we give. And I mean, I give it for free all the time is, you know, the, the new hardware, the like Ant Miner S19 Pro is completely overpriced and I can prove, I can prove it, right? And the, and the reason it's overpriced is because what we spoke about earlier about the efficiency of the chip. But see, the, the thing is, is that these oil and gas guys, they don't have an efficiency problem. They have too much energy. Right? So they don't need their the machines to be more efficient. They don't have a cost of energy problem. What they have is they have a problem of like, hey, we've got way too much energy that we need to use. So it economically makes sense for them sometimes to just build another data center with another engine and use older machines at, and minor S9s. They'll, they'll spend less money doing that than they will upgrading to these you know, $7,000 machines. And you know these are out in the middle of kind of nowhere. Um, like sometimes these machines, you know, 
fail or their, their boards uh, fry and you need to replace them. Like it's impractical for them to have $150,000 of computers sitting out in a, you know, in a data center in the middle of nowhere. There's kind of like a security issue there. And also like if one of them breaks, like, damn it, that's like seven grand or 6,000 bucks. Like it, it hurts. Or they could use S9s, which are like 250, 300 bucks a pop or whatever. And if one of them goes down, they just pull it out. They put, they, they swap it out and they, they investigate. And if it's broken, it's not the end of the world. It's a couple hundred bucks. Um, like there's just a practicality there. And so a lot of these guys have run the numbers before, but they ran the numbers using brand new ASICs, brand new Bitcoin mining hardware. And the, the numbers kind of suck. Right, because they're overspending on this hardware side, not realizing that they don't need to be efficient. Right? And, I, I, and I, I just, I just come and right? I just come and tell them like, you guys, you don't need to buy those machines. Like those things are overpriced. They're not for you. Those are built for guys that need to plug in on the grid. And if they're not this efficient, the guys that are on the grid, like they're losing money every minute that they're mining. But with these guys in the oil field, like they could mine Bitcoin to zero. A lot of them. I mean, especially if it's a flare, like they should literally mine Bitcoin, even if it goes to zero, because it's saving them a cost. I mean, they, they pay people to come into the oil field and combust their gas for them. Like they actually pay people to well, take care of their gas. What is the ROI so, or whatever on this? Oh, like, I mean, it's, 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 it's like so negative 30 months I mean, or something. It's, exactly. It's like, it, it's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's like, like the minute the they think up, of it, they just end up yeah, becoming profitable. Yeah. That's exactly how it feels, right? This is I too mean, much. So, and, and, and I'll say like one of the biggest hurdles, <laughs> at least I had recently was, was you know, the, the numbers look like a scam. That's part of the problem is that you run the numbers with you guys and they're like, well, this can't be right. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. you, there's no way, you know, like that's yeah. gotta be a scam. There's no way this lasts. The, like, so, like they, it's, it's too good, right? It's honestly an issue. The craziest thing about this opportunity is that even if people heard this conversation and knew about it, they would be nuts to even think about trying to do something like this because yes. like they call, uh, I spent eight years, nine years in robotics. <laughs> Um, I spent maybe five years in the, in, you know, living in Fort McMurray, or no, I spent maybe seven, 20 years in Alberta, but five years in Fort McMurray. And I've seen kind of, but I, I, I really do feel that this is, oh my God, dude, this is so massive. Shoot. Okay. So, okay. So, okay. Okay. okay you know what? Okay. I'm, I can go in a million, okay, but we only have uh, a few more minutes. I wanted to kind yeah. of uh, switch gears. Was there anything else you wanted to share about upstream data in general? I don't want to uh yeah, you I'm talked about your story you talked about upstream data i mean there's so much i feel like we could just keep yeah. going man and, and i really do want to know what like uh, later if whenever you think about it if there's anything i can do to kind of help further this agenda please <laughs> let me know man this is absolutely super man fun. um I'll, I'll i'll just leave it with you know just a, a send-off note on upstream data like I, th I think steve barber's the real pioneer in this space right i mean as far as i was concerned i was looking and he was the only person i could find on earth doing this um mm -hmm. <laughs> when i was looking at least um and you know he's he's an oil and gas guy by trade he's a petroleum engineer and he he just builds so so practically right it's just a practical structure he thinks practically and it's not about being fancy and having you know like some crazy tech it's about like it being easy to use durable and autonomous and so you know, I think that the mindset that Steve brings to to this, you know, building for this this future is the right mindset. And that's why I'm so happy to, to be at Upstream Data. I mean, I would have worked for any of the guys. I mean, I even asked Marty Bent, you know, at, at Great American Mining if he would hire me. And they weren't hiring at the time, right, when I asked. Um, but like, and I would I would love to work for those guys too. But Upstream is was my my you know first choice where, just where, because I think Steve's got at? the right. Uh, Great right. American Mining. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I yeah they're, really... they're doing essentially the same thing. I mean, they build a little bit hmm. different, but they're, you know, great guys and they're, I think they're doing great work. Um, you know, I, and the, the only reason I would prefer Steve over them is just because, I, I mean, I knew Steve and I think he's got just a great, he's got the, the perfect attitude and the perfect um, vision for where this is headed. And, um, he, you know, he's, he's, he's skating to where the puck's going to be and, um, you know, doing it doing it right and so that's yeah. that's what I'm, I'm glad to work for them rather than i mean there's a couple I, other guys in the space that are just like i don't know what they're doing how they're building but it's it's interesting. I, I i remember when i first heard about it i think i was at crack it at the time but um i, re I hit up steven he, he was kind enough to hop on a call with me as well and i got the same vibe man like he's totally on point and um yeah um but i, I guess the point i was gonna make earlier is, is that my, my realization after spending so long in oil and robotics is that they call hardware hardware because it's hard 
Yes. <laughs> and, yes. Oh, uh, and I've worked literally, like I said, in the oil sands. And I, 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 I ran. I ran from that space because it's freaking hard. And I've spent, you know, the bulk of my career over the last 10 years in software. But that's what makes me believe that, like, you know, that nobody is going to even think about this stuff because who, who thinks about like natural gas and like flares, well, yeah. and, like pipes, well, that's and, part of the, it's, it's you like know, energy. Their car. Like <laughs> nobody knows how their car works. They just know that when they press the pedal, like it goes right. Yeah. Like, they know where to put gas in. But they like have no idea how the gas even got to the station and they have no idea how energy like, they're moving. Right. Like, but everyone owns a car. Right. And so it's like, I, I think there's, you're right. Like, part of oil of energy production especially oil and gas people really don't know how it works they don't ha- know how it works and, and and don't get me wrong i for the longest time was kind of a bit brainwashed by this whole like oh green blah 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 <laughs> and everything's gonna save the world and i drive a tesla for the record right so i definitely <laughs> believe in it but i like the fact that it drives itself by the way um right. but, but but i was gonna say is is that but we've gone as a world way too far. Like, like if people literally think that 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 that, that we're gonna get away with not using oil, like it's literally used no. to make everything. Everything. No, yeah, fossil fuels are the foundation. And it's like, it, 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 and let, let's import it from Venezuela instead, or like I don't know what. What are we gonna do yeah, if we don't, don't like do it on, <laughs> or like, like from like, the Middle East? Like it's just here? it's yeah. just weird. So I think the world's gone way overboard, and it just doesn't make any sense to me. But the fact that. Oh, the P that the people that the, the people can use Bitcoin to take that power back is so freaking inspiring. Um, okay, okay. What is one thing that you believe to be true that others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? You know, I, I <laughs> probably actually did a lot of that finding, today already. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, right. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been finding kind of just that point we just made is like I feel like even in Bitcoin, even with a lot of Bitcoiners I talk to, they have this idea that, you know, I think that the language they use is phasing out. We need to phase out fossil fuels is something they, they it's a oh, language. No. <laughs> and they have this kind of idea that we're going to like just flip at some point. Like, like we're literally going to look at the grid one day and be like, oh, look, it's all of it comes from the wind now. No. Um, like they don't, I don't think people realize how, like what impact the fossil fuel industry has on the world. And so what I would argue is that um, Bitcoin is going to get us to produce, you know, just exponentially more energy is going to be produced. And I'd say that the, I mean, maybe this isn't controversial, but I'd say the Bitcoin network is going to consume over half of, you know, the energy that's produced on earth quite soon. Um, like I'd say within the next 20 years is Bitcoin, like we'll actually end up get, getting to the point where Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network consumes more electricity than all humans. And I think that's a good thing, right? I mean, that's, I'm somebody that believes, you know, energy, energy density per capita improves quality of life, improves technological advancement and, I don't. I'm. I consider myself an environmentalist in the sense that I believe in innovation that will cause efficiencies and allow us to to advance without destroying that which we live on. Right. Um, I don't think that we need to like go back to caveman days in order to save the planet. Like I don't think that's. We don't need to stop having electricity. Uh, that's the. You know. I don't think that that's the way to go. So I would say that Bitcoin is going to consume way more energy than we even we would even care to admit. And it's not a bad thing. Why again? Like the well, fact that we're going to be not, good just because it's, I, I like that density comment, but you kind of lost yeah, me a little well, bit. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> that's what you but find like, is, is if you look at, if you look at culture, you look at civilization, the, the best quality of life comes from typically where the most energy is produced and consumed, right? As energy mm. consumption, really consumption, and you can't consume without production, but as energy consumption grows, so does quality of life. So do birth rates, education rates, um, you know, I mean, it's even crime rates, um, all, all are directly cor- correlated with um, energy consumption. And so, I mean, I, I mean, look, why do we even have the ability to, to, pre- you know, perform a heart surgery, right? Like, like what kind of, what, what kind of energy input goes into a heart surgery? Um, and if you really look at like something like that, you realize, wow, like a heart surgery is a ton of energy. I mean, from like, you know, you could be flying an organ from another, I mean, you could talk about a plane flight plus, I mean, all this energy that gets input into the surgery. Well, but we would all agree that the ability to do like a heart transplant and prolong somebody's life is a good thing. Well, guess what? In order for us to be able to have the technology to do that, we needed to have the energy input to even begin even talking about the conversation of transplanting somebody's heart. And so it, these things, you know, energy, electricity especially is just a foundation 
for technological advancement. And the more people that have reliable and economic electricity, the better the world's going to be. Um, and, the, and the more efficient we'll, we'll become because of our technological advancement. So, so this I don't, also, yeah. wait, hold on. Oh my God. So this also promotes the decentralization of energy. Absolutely. Oh, wow. oh get to the point where, I mean, <laughs> Holy God. I, okay, I have to ask you right. one more thing. Huge Texas, yeah. right? They were down wind turbines, frozen using helicopters that run on oil, putting fertilizer, I mean, or whatever, not fertilizer, but using things that are made of yeah, oil chemical. to try and defrost. I mean, it was just hilarious. It was hilarious to see all that. But, but, but I got to admit, I woke up like two days ago and I was telling my wife, I'm like, wait, so I wonder if that problem was caused by the fact that they have one centralized exchange called ERCOT. Like, I wonder if there'd ever be a decentralized exchange of energy or exchange. Does well, that make sense even? Or is that just me who, uh, well, reading no, too much I mean, DeFi shit? That's why right, you're reading too much DeFi shit probably. You know? <laughs> okay. but, but like, that's, that's, I mean, ultimately what you're talking about is like somebody's got to, is going to put the capital for like the, the, the distribution. But this is, but you, your point is well taken in a sense that this is what I, I think about, is I think about people having sovereign electricity. And like we talk about sovereign money, sovereign travel, um, being able to generate your own electricity at your house, you know, sovereignly, have sovereign ownership over that, that production, um, makes sense if you mine Bitcoin with it, right? It makes sense to produce your own power at your house, potentially. Um, it, it makes sense to even build a product that allows people to produce power at their own house, like a solar panel or like a, even like a, a little small, you know, coal fire gen set kind of a thing and, you know, an external combustion engine. Um, but what we would look at with Texas, if we were in a hyper Bitcoinized kind of a world is what we would see is that we're producing likely, you know, 10 times more energy in Texas than we would, than we are today. Um, if we're in a hyper Bitcoinized world, because people are incentivized to go produce energy when in a Bitcoin world. And because we're producing so much more than the humans actually need, the actual people in proximity to the generation of electricity, um, you know, we're in a position where if we had a situation like a massive freeze like that, well, we would be producing so much more energy <laughs> overall. I got we could it, just I divert got it. it right? We just insane. divert it. I mean, we, 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 the, the oh issue wouldn't have even happen. They, they'd be down for an hour. Thank right? you, Maybe Satoshi. Um, I wonder right, exactly. if he knew what he was up to, man. This is insane. Right. And this we don't insane. even need the freaking bureaucrats to make it happen because people are going to be naturally economically incentivized this to go produce insane. more energy, to, to have, you know, solutions to these problems without having to hold a gun to something. I mean, that's what's so cool about the, you know, with flare gas is no regulator has to hold a gun to the, the oil and gas producer's head and say, hey, stop flaring your methane, right? The oil and gas producers are going to be the ones that are like, hey, we need to stop flaring our methane. Like they're going to act in their own best interest. And it happens to be the best interest of, you know, environment, so of the environment. So it's like, that's a much better mechanism, much more efficient mechanism for achieving a desired outcome than, you know, policy and freaking political policy, you know, law making laws i mean this is just so much better and so man i, I have a hard this time with people so if people are better. environmentalists and they're they're not pro bitcoin I, I feel like they're just being you know intellectually dishonest okay uh dude th this was phenomenal <laughs> i i again i could keep going man i have so many questions but i'm gonna let you go because i know you must be super busy and i'm pretty sure people got like more than enough for for them to kind of like mull on i mean oh my god i i'm not gonna be able to sleep tonight okay so dude where where do people just kind of maybe shill the website and hey by yeah. the way before before we go to that sorry real on a selfish note so as i mentioned i'm canadian albertan born blah 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 but i started india's first bitcoin company Company, like the Coinbase of India, oh, awesome. right in December 2013, and oh, we were right. also I knew that about you, Sonny. I'm sorry, yeah. I knew that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we've been kind of you know doing that. Uh, th th there's a bit of a uh, you know a conversation around potentially uh, India banning Bitcoin. We're obviously fighting tooth and nail on every front you can possibly imagine um, to to see to it that it doesn't happen. But like just through the lens of what we just spoke about, right? India's, you know, a democratic country. They believe in freedom and freedom of speech. I mean, uh, anyway, so, so, but just curious, what might that mean for the, the future youth of like the energy market and like the youth of, of India, right? Of, of like banning it. Like, I don't know. I meet the smartest people in this space, you know, it's like, why would we, uh. I think, I mean, you know, to speak toward whether it's bad or good or those guys, like those are tough and broad strokes to, to conclude. But what I will say is, 
in this in this day and age, I feel like people are more resilient than they ever have been right in the information age where we're faster to adapt because we're faster to to understand. And so, you know, I, I would put my money on the side of the people of India will if, if they're feeling truly, you know, strangled by this regulation, I think they'll flee. I think they'll find another jurisdiction that that allows them to go achieve the goals they want to achieve. And, you know, I think a, a majority of them will. Uh, but you're right for the rest those who literally just are just get get cut off from this this tool right i mean bitcoin's a tool it's a monetary tool at the end of the day and those who get restricted from using it um man i mean that's just i can't i can't think of something so abhorrent i mean mm -hmm. it's just it's, a, it's like it's like cutting somebody off from the freedom of speech um it's cutting them off from the freedom of you know monetary sovereignty the freedom of owning mm -hmm. what i've made and mm -hmm. to take that from somebody is, I mean, th that would be a, a resentment that I would feel forever, right? So they mm -hmm. will make they will make serious enemies out of, um, you know, the citizens of India, if the citizens of India truly understand what was taken from them, right? They mm -hmm. do want, if they begin to understand what Bitcoin is, they'll realize what was taken from them, and I would be livid, right? And same yeah. thing here in the U.S. If they start, I mean, I, I, I mean, that's that's. If you're going to take away my means to have sovereignty over my the fruits of my labor, like that's a call to arms, right? That's a call to that. That's mm. the moment you stand up because mm -hmm. at that point you're. I mean, you're totally getting bent over a barrel, right? Mm. Like that's a that's a moment to stand. And so, I would imagine a lot of them will feel the same way. And and I, I can't imagine they feel anything but disdain toward the policymakers that mm. that go through with that. And cool, the bankers, man. obviously, the bankers are probably fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're probably happy. This has been, uh, like I said, I think I'm on episode almost 90. This has been definitely one of my favorite ones, if not the favorite. Dude, this has been amazing. Hey, Steve's got awesome an open study. invite. I don't want to be too pushy or too weird, oh, but I'll, I'll pass you know, if he's down, uh, love yeah. to love to do an interview. And yeah, man, let's do a checkup, a check in whenever you're free, whenever you're down again to do one. But uh, in the meantime, DM me. Let me know if, if there's anything I can do to help at all. Okay. Hey, definitely, Sunny. Oh, so yeah, Shield the, the website and your Twitter oh, yeah. handle so, and all that stuff. Sorry, I forgot. So for Upstream, it's upstreamdata.ca because we're a Canadian company. So upstreamdata.ca is, is our website. And then um, you can find me, Denver Bitcoin, on Twitter. My name's Adam. Um, I also have a Medium page on my Twitter bio that you could – I've written some articles about this, you know, how it maybe impacts international relations. I've done a couple other uh, podcasts and stuff. So if you want to find stuff on, Dick. you know, that, I, that I've made – Check that out. Um, otherwise, Sonny, you're the best, man. Thanks so much for having me. This was Love a it. blast. This is um, amazing. I, I, I'm glad we got to connect. I hope to, I hope to meet you one day. Okay, so I'm going to kill it now. Thank you very much again. Just stick around for 10 seconds.